I'm really pleased to introduce, we're so happy to have them. We have Pamela Meyer. Pamela Meyer is a PhD and the president of Meyer Creativity Associates, where she works with organizations internationally who want to be more innovative and agile. Meyer is the author of multiple books on innovation, learning, and change, including From Workspace to Playspace, Innovating, Learning, and Changing Through Dynamic Engagement, as well as the book you received today, The Agility Shift. If you did not pick it up, don't panic. You can pick one up on the way out. Uh, she also has a speaking and consulting practice. She teaches courses in business creativity, organizational change, and adult learning at DePaul University School for New Learning in Chicago, where she is also the director of the Center to Advance Education for Adults. She will be available after today's presentation right outside the curtain to sign books and answer your questions. Phil Pamonti has served for the past 10 years as the managing editor of Federal Employees News Digest, which is a flagship publication of Federal Soup. It's been around since 1951. Phil has not, just the last 10 years. <laughs> uh, over the past 30 years, though, he has also served in editorial and research positions across a range of industries, including editorial director of the Financial Times' former U.S.-based telecom news unit, managing editor of the Washington Post's former News Bites News Network, and editorial director of the FDA News for Washington Business Information. He holds an MA in journalism from Ohio State University. So welcome to Making the Agility Shift, and please tell us about it. All right. Okay, uh, one of the first questions I was gonna ask you, of course, is what inspired you to put the book, the, the book together, but when we were talking earlier, when you told me how you sort of evolved into this field, it was a very interesting story, so I'd like you to, pre uh, to preface how you got into the book with how you got into doing what you do. Oh, good. Thank you. So uh, my, my story starts probably like, like many of you. I, I, I didn't uh, expect to find myself doing what I'm doing now. I actually started out in the theater. I went to undergraduate theater school as a production major and ended up uh, by a series of, of uh, you know, funny cycles. Yes, to uh, in Chicago, where I had a theater company, and we, because Chicago is a hotbed of improvisation, I was working with improvisers in rehearsal halls, and we were doing a lot of improv work, um, generating material for original theater, and that got me very interested in innovation, the creative process more broadly, so I did a graduate degree focusing on creativity, improvisation, and started teaching in our adult program at DePaul for many mid-career adults who are finishing their undergraduate or graduate degrees. And as I was using some of the improvisation techniques and strategies in the adult learning classroom, people started saying, hey, this is really cool. Could you, could you uh, come to my company and, and help us out and, and help introduce some of these ideas in our organization? And that actually led to that becoming a much larger practice than my work at the university. But over the years of, of doing that work, I started hearing these wonderful stories of transformation of people that attributed the changes in their lives to the time they had spent learning to improvise. And so I focused my doctoral research on just what happens for people as they're learning to improvise, as they're becoming more agile and innovative. And that was partly the focus of my last book, From Workplace to Play Space, because the big aha from that was much more than the skills and knowledge that people create, it's about, um, or, or develop, it's about the spaces they co-create that enable them to step out of their comfort zone, to try on new roles, to um, be, more, be more agile, essentially. So that's sort of what led me up to, uh, to writing this current book. Um, so I guess that brings up the big question, how do you define the agility shift? Ah, how do I define the agility shift? And we've got a slide on that, a couple of, a couple of slides in, but um, uh, essentially I talk about the agility shift as our ability to respond effectively to the unexpected and unplanned as well as uh, quickly turn challenges into opportunities. And a lot of that does come from some of the lessons I learned uh, in those early days of the theater, but more recently over the last 20 years working with organizations across industries that I recognize they need to make some significant shifts to be more agile and, and innovative. And, and the, the aspects, the, the d dynamics of uh, the agility shift or of agility are? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll, I'll share those. And actually, before I share these six dynamics, I did want to share a little story that led to, um, 
really, to me, brought together all of the, the reasons to write a book like this, which um, actually happened not too many years ago when I was invited into a large international organization to uh, lead what was essentially framed as a team building session. And this had been planned for many months, and they had um, really wanted to recognize this team that had been involved in some very stressful but ultimately productive collaborations. And uh, so we were getting really excited about this session. Leading up to the day of the session, I had arrived a little bit early, and I was sitting out in the parking lot of uh, this company reading the business headlines on my mobile device when I saw the very first headline was that the company I was about to work with had just announced record losses and was going to be laying off thousands of people. And this is the stuff of facilitator and consultant nightmares, right? So I, I go into the building, and it's a ghost town. And the HR director who had hired me comes walking down the hall to meet me, and he tells me that at that very moment, the entire company is in a global town hall meeting about the layoffs. And of course, I'm overcome with a desire to uh, remember uh, an urgent conflict or fall ill. Uh, but he says, he says, don't worry, don't worry. We're going to go ahead with your session. And in fact, the people who are in that meeting are going to leave it a little early. And we're going to go ahead. And I'm thinking, great, great. So we, we get to the session room. People start filing in. And they don't yet know how the layoffs are going to impact them personally. But I realize this is really a time for me to practice what I preach. I've got to quickly reframe the session, reframe it as it relates to their current scenario. And uh, it ended up being one of the more inspiring sessions because people actually very quickly started looking for the opportunities in the change and the uncertainty that lied at, lies ahead. But what, what I realized is not only was this an example of a company that um, failed to make the agility shift for a number of reasons, but then at the team and leadership level, there became some new opportunities for shifts that they then had to be making very, very quickly if they were going to stay competitive. So I realized from that experience and many others that at all levels of the organization, we need some guidance for what's happening in the organizations that are sustaining their capacity to be agile and what kinds of things do we want to avoid if, uh, if we want to be around five years from now. So that leads to the six okay. dynamics. So, so um, over the years of doing this work and research, I've discovered what I call the six dynamics of the agility shift. And, and I review them in, in the book that each of you have. So I'll give you a quick preview now. It starts with what I call the relational web, the web of skills, knowledge, talent, and resources that you need to be able to tap at a moment's notice when things don't go as planned or when a new opportunity arises. And many of you have had this own experience, whether in your personal life or in, a, in the midst of a business opportunity. It's the nature of how robust and diverse our relational web is that actually can make or break our capacity to, to be successful. So that's the, that's the core of the agility shift and some of the strategies that I outline. But agile organizations also continue to maintain their capacity to be relevant to the marketplace, to what's happening in the geopolitical situation, even what's happening in their employee uh, population. They're responsive to both the unexpected and unplanned and emerging needs and changes. But they also manage to be resilient. They're able to quickly regroup when things don't go as planned. And they're also, this is I think something particularly important for, you, for this audience, they manage to be resourceful. And this means that they're not looking and, and uh, always making excuses for if only they had more money or more time or more staff. They're actually working effect effectively within available resources. So that's what we mean by being resourceful. And interestingly, where some of the lessons from improvisation come to bear here, because improvisers are great at working within the givens. So we need to understand how do we better identify the givens and, and work within those. But agile organizations don't just do these five things well. They consistently do something that sets them apart from other organizations, which is they manage to consistently be reflective. And we talk about the need to be reflective, but many of us you know, are so busy focused on what's right at hand or solving the immediate crisis or opportunity, and then we go on to the next thing. And agile organizations are not only learning in the midst of action, they're taking in new information and adapting, 
but they also regularly step back and learn the lessons from experience and intentionally apply those lessons going forward. So these six dynamics are key aspects of the agility shift, and I, I talk about what those look like at all levels of the organization. Um, also in the book, you cite a term borrowed from the military, which is VUCA, the volatility, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And if you could speak to how that interplays with your... Yes, absolutely. How many of you are familiar with this term, VUCA? Good. It's, uh, it actually, as it turns out, was coined uh, just down the road at the U.S. Army War College, that, that it, it was um, coined to describe essentially the changing conditions on the battlefield. It stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And uh, certainly in the changing war theater, people have recognized that the, many of the strategies that were much more command and control oriented aren't as effective in a, a situation that's highly complex, rapidly changing. And so this term, many of you know, is now being widely used in other arenas to describe the business environment, the geopolitical environment. But interestingly, um, well, in the, it, when we think about a much more stable arena, we can concentrate on core competencies of planning and analysis, whereas in a VUCA environment, we have to develop some new competencies, competencies for individual, team, and organizational agility, as well as something that some of you may be familiar with, a term that's becoming very hot in learning and development, learning agility, or the capacity to learn and adapt in the midst of change. Okay, can we talk a little bit about agile leadership? in terms of um, you know, one of some of the key things you need to know to become an agile leader. Good, and, and um, one of the biggest shifts that's happening is in fact that we're even, when we, when we talk about agility, even reframing what we mean by leadership. Who is a leader in an agile organization? What does that mean? And I actually define an agile leader as anyone who spots a challenge or, or opportunity and effectively responds. So that means we're not thinking that um, leaders are only those that have certain titles or a certain compensation package or a certain position in the org chart. We're truly talking about people at any level of the organization who spot the challenge or opportunity and are empowered to respond and take the initiative to respond. And one of my favorite stories, I share this in the book, is, is in fact, um, came from one of the companies I profiled. Many of you are familiar with um, that I specifically chose companies and, and organizations across sectors that um, aren't corporate fairy tales. I'm not looking to just say, you know, this is some Pollyanna situation, but companies that really bumped up against their capacity to be agile. And one of those was UPS, United Parcel Service, that you, some of you may remember a few years ago, they, they encountered um, really a perfect storm, a, a literal storm that blew across the country during the holiday season. It was a shorter than normal shopping season that year, and, um, and many retailers had promised next day delivery. And in the midst of all of that, the you know, flights were canceled, the roads were shut down, so they, they bumped up against some serious challenges. And since then, I've made some more shifts and changes, and a, and a big shift is a change in their understanding of leadership. So one of the stories that came out of that time was actually a facility manager at one of the off-site UPS locations. He was, um, this is a quiet center on the weekends, hardly anybody there, and he was making the rounds in his facility, walking through the automotive department, and there was a phone that was ringing and ringing on somebody's desk, and he, um, he thought, well, this probably doesn't have anything to do with me, but he picked up the phone. Turned out it was a mother that was frantically searching for her daughter's wedding dress. Somehow the bridal shop had mislabeled the dress and it was stuck somewhere in the UPS system. And the, the facilities manager says to the mother, um, well, ma'am, I, uh, I, I just take care of the building, but let me, let me see what I can do. He hangs up the phone, he takes down her information, he makes a few more phone calls, he's able to track down the wedding dress stuck in the back of a shipping container somewhere, get it messengered over to the bride in time for the wedding. And that's a great example of an agile leader. Nobody, first of all, told this person they had to pick up the phone or go the extra mile, but someone who spotted a challenge or opportunity 
and effectively responded. And that's the kind of leadership that we're talking about if we're really, if we're really making agility a strategic priority and, and we really believe that uh, it's going to shift how we're operating. And we're, you know, certainly we've got some particular opportunities when we're thinking about the government sector, or those of you who are working in government, or those of you who are, uh, are interfacing and have strategic partnerships in, in this particular sector. That sort of the, plays into the idea of role elasticity, somebody doing something, and, and, and its role in being part of a team as well, so. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it is one of the, the, um, the concepts that I talk about, and, and I also use, when we talk about agile teams, I draw on lessons. We, we've sort of abandoned the sports team metaphor for teamwork in, for a couple of reasons. One is it, it turned out it wasn't that success or that um, accessible for people if you didn't have a, a prior sports exper uh, experience. But um, it also, when it comes to agility, anything may be able to happen on game day, but people are still working from a, a pre-planned playbook. So I prefer some other metaphors for teamwork. One is the, the metaphor for teams that have to create an entire evening of theater based on one or two suggestions from the audience. How many of you have been to an improv show, a live, a live show? Good. So many of you have already seen this in action. So improvisers are putting some specific principles into practice. They're building on each other's ideas. They're thinking on their feet. They're being much more agile in a much more dynamic environment. But we're also learning lessons from Agile project management. At first it started in Agile software development. How many of you are, are familiar with Agile methodologies or using some of these methods in your, in your systems? Oh, good. So many of you already know this, but Agile, Agile software teams made a shift some years ago from what's called waterfall project planning, where you get all of the input up front and have this beautiful plan. It looks great on paper with this big debut launch plan. plan. But at the end, at that debut date, it turns out often things are way off the mark because that plan didn't incorporate all of the ways that the client changed his or her mind along the way or all of the discoveries that happened along the way. So agile project teams are starting to move to these rapid learning cycles, often called sprints, where you're working in much tighter collaboration with the client and getting some working version of the product or even the concept. It can, it can work in a lot of uh, settings. So we're working in much more of a rapid prototyping, rapid learning strategy where we're working to fail faster and learn quicker. And there are some big shifts. That's a shift in our mindset, but also a shift in, in how we collaborate. And as we become more macro in this discussion, going from leaders to, to teams, now we go to the entire organization, which in the, in the case of government, you find an organization where it may not be quite as easy to implement something like that, where it's more hierarchical, hierarchical and, it's, uh, and it's more, there, there are more uh, restraints in terms of operations. Yeah, like absolutely. That. How many of you feel like you fit in that realm that you may be totally on board with being agile, but maybe you're working in a much more um, constrained uh, organizational <laughs> structure or, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so if you're, whether you're in, in military or government, healthcare, and, and many other industries, um, whether we're talking about f finance or a number of institutions have very significant constraints. One of the shifts that I've seen organizations doing uh, is actually they're, they're recognized that they, they likely don't have a large amount of control over the organizational structure. Those that do are shifting to more flat organizational structures, uh, more network structures that do support uh, more active communication, collaboration, and coordination. But when you don't have that kind of influence, we have to focus on the things that we can impact. And some of that's our mindset, how we're going to collaborate within that structure. I talk about um, organizations as meaning-making systems. And one of the shifts, this actually came out of uh, some of the research that was done in the Army, was uh, a shift from thinking about organizations as um, information systems to systems of interactions. And when we think about organizations as systems of interactions, then we can shift how we relate to each other. Even if we're working within a very hierarchical structure, we're focusing on the meaning that we make in the midst of all of the, the activity. And, and it doesn't mean that we don't care about information. We're, of course, in the age of big data and data analytics. We care deeply about it. 
but we understand that to make sense of the data, we do so in the midst of interactions. And I'll share just a, ver a very brief example of, of what I mean by that. I was working with a, a relatively small company in Chicago, where I'm from, digital media company, and we spent an afternoon together collecting some data, and in this case, we were actually mapping out their business ecosystem. And we made this big, uh, crazy wall of post-it notes and arrows, and we started out first mapping out their immediate, um, their immediate workers' contract, workers' vendors, and then we went out to their clients, their dream clients, prospective clients, and then further out to the other inhabitants of the ecosystem, those that had a mutual stake in shared success or interdependent relationships, so educational institutions, think tanks, the media, other core stakeholders. And we left that map with all of its chaos and dotted lines and arrows on the wall for about a week in the conference room. And this is a room that people would regularly have lunch and take breaks and have conversations and work in their project teams. Well, what was really cool was about a week later, Tim Frick, who's the CEO of the company, sent me an email with this long list of ideas that his staff had generated by interacting with the data. So it wasn't enough that we just mapped it out. What they needed was some time to make meaning of it, to add their ideas, to ponder it, to, make, to see more relationships between it, to understand what story the data was telling, what questions to ask it. And that's what led to the innovation and some of their next iterations of, of agility in the marketplace. So that's what I mean when I talk about agile organizations as meaning-making systems. And those are things that can happen even in very hierarchical situations. It just means making the space for it, valuing it, and being sure that we create some frameworks that recognize the need to communicate, collaborate, and coordinate to whatever degree you can within the structures that, that are available for you. Uh, that would sort of lead, in terms of the relationships, it would also lead to relationships outside the organization, outside the team, in terms of the, the individual or the teams of the organization's ecosystem. Exactly. So uh, talk about how that makes a more agile organization. Absolutely, and so, so I made mention of it in terms of this work that we did at, at Mighty Bytes, but recognizing that not only do you have an important organizational system that you're operating within, but you're a part of your entity or organization is part of a larger ecosystem. And that ecosystem is made up of other entities that either have interdependent relationships or a mutual stake in your shared success. And one of the things that agile organizations are, are recognizing is the need to identify the other entities in their ecosystem and be more intentional in how they participate in it, how they co-create that ecosystem. So it can be everything from hosting lunch and learns or being sure that you're um, an active part of relevant associations, think tank partners, but also um, many organizations are, are creating open innovation networks to be sure that idea sharing and uh, RFPs are being posted more broadly, not assuming that all of the knowledge is going to, um, has to live within the walls of the organization, that it's a much more permeable dynamic uh, environment that, that we need to be agile within. And, and that does take a level of intentionality that um, in, in traditional business school terms was not uh, a big part of, of how people were they, were, they were socialized and trained for a much more competitive environment rather than a mutually dependent uh, relationship within the ecosystem. Um, before we go to questions, I just want you to speak briefly about the agility shift inventory. Oh yes, excellent. So in addition to, and some of you um, got a, a little yellow card thrown into your book, and if not, there's a big stack out front, but it, one of the things that I discovered along the way was that um, sustaining the agility shift was, was a, a key challenge. That it's, uh, and I liken it to organizational fitness. We're, we're, you know, we, we don't just um, buy the gym membership or that 10 pack of training sessions and assume we're, we're going to be fit forever and ever. It takes a, a day in and day out commitment. So a lot of the stories and um, what I call the makeshift happen practices in the, in the book are designed to support sustained agility. And a big part of that is actually having continuous conversations. And that's what the agility shift inventory 
will lead you to. So the, the website is, is here. It's also on the yellow card we have out front. But it's about, it takes about five to 10 minutes to take it. And it will give you a snapshot of your current capacity to be agile in your current context. So it's not a referendum on you personally. It get, gets you thinking about your current organizational context and then also generates a series of reflective questions that you can either just take on yourself or bring back to your team or a mentor or a coach and get that conversation going in your organization as part of, uh, as part of the ongoing commitment to sustaining agility. And I've, I've also got a few more resources there on the website for you if, you, if you'd like to stay in touch and continue to uh, generate ideas. Okay, now we'd like to open it up to questions. If I've got the microphone over here. Anyone? Ed Mason, uh, I did 28 years in the Army and now I'm a consultant. So did you address in this the different components of personnel as far as an effective organization? Like the younger generation tends to turn over a lot more quickly. Um, the aging workforce preparing to retire. Any of that? Yes, absolutely. And how many of you are looking at, uh, at this in your organizations? Both, we're, we already know that, that millennials are currently 50% um, of the workforce, and, and, or, or very, we're very close to the 50% mark in the next generation coming in. And yet we have, we've also got older workers that have a wealth of knowledge and experience. Not only do we want to be sure we're retaining the, the knowledge and transferring the knowledge effectively, but that we're also attracting uh, the millennial organization and retaining them. Now, interestingly, a lot of the dynamics of the agile organization are tailor-made for millennials and, and the next generation because they're highly attuned to working in a much more collaborative, on, autonomous environment. And they're also very driven by uh, a, a sense of purpose. So they're looking for not necessarily a micromanaged work experience, but one where they're given some strategic direction. They're given uh, not necessarily the how-to, but the why behind what they're doing. And then, of course, some parameters to set them up for success. But you're absolutely right. And this is at all levels of the organization. That, and I, I do address these specifically, the, the level of leadership teams and organizations. But uh, the good news is the Agile organization is a perfect environment for retaining a, a millennial employee because they are also very geared toward continuous learning. Yeah, thank you. All right, hold on. <laughs> Tom Dickinson, uh, Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend as far as forming teams with the unity and common vision and so on, but the individual members don't have a common background? Ah, They're good. strangers. They don't really know each other. And you're, you're forced to form a team, but it's going to be one that's going to exist for a long period of time. But like I say, no common background. They, they don't know each other, that kind of thing. What would you recommend? Yes, excellent. And, and interestingly, the, the guidance for this comes from two very disparate areas. One is improv teams who are often thrown together even that night, a few minutes before they go on stage, and, uh, and also SWAT teams and film crews. And I, I highlight some of the research that's been done on these ad hoc teams. A couple of, a couple of dynamics. One is the teams are, are able to be effective because they do have an immediate sense of trust that they know. For example, in improvisation, if anyone here taken an improv class or, oh, excellent. Oh, excellent, excellent. And you ended up in the military, interesting. Oh, good. That's another story. Uh, but one of the first things that you learn, the very first night of improvisation, is the principle of yes and. Many of you know this even if you haven't taken an improv class, that we accept whatever we're given and then we build on it. Well, any improv player that gets together on stage knows that they can trust their fellow players to build on whatever they give them. They don't have to have worked with them for years and years. That's an that's a absolute given that that principle will be practiced on any improv stage anywhere in the country, actually anywhere internationally, if you, if you have an improv background. S turns out it's similar with SWAT teams and, and film crews as well that often are coming together in ad hoc situation. But uh, SWAT teams in particular often have shared training even if they haven't personally worked together. So it's in part a myth that we have to have spent years and years working together, building trust, knowing each other's family history 
to be able to truly be effective. Sometimes it's just knowing what credentials somebody brings in or the fact that um, you, you were invited to be on the team already gives you enough of a credential and credibility to be effective to hit the ground running. If you, absent that, it's worth taking at least a little bit of time to come up with some shared agreements to be sure that the team itself has some time to co-create some shared agreements for how it's going to operate what kinds of communication strategies that, that it's going to use. Because it, if we don't have strong communication, no matter what kind of history a team has or what, what its background is, you won't have trust. People need to know that if there's an issue, if you have a problem with me, if I have a problem with you, or if there's something happening in the environment, we're going to identify it and share the information about it on a need to know basis, of course, but that we can be effective in the, in the context. But I think you're identifying something that's more and more across industries um, an, an issue. And we need to be able to hit the ground running, not feel like we need some huge forming, storming, norming process. We need to be able to do this much more effectively now. Yeah, thank you for raising that. Any other questions? I actually have a few more. Go for it. Um, and one was uh, in terms of using agility to speed things up. And I had down here yep. collaboration, communication, coordination. And I was wondering if you give a good example where somebody's harnessed all three of those elements or Oh, motion. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, it, it, I mean, it happens in all kinds of contexts. But this is a big shift at the leadership level, but also in teams from command and control to communication, collaboration, and coordination. And um, one of the examples that, uh, I, I, again, in Chicago I, was shared with me recently was um, uh, from the, the uh, president of Chicago Scenic Studios. This is a, started out as a small scene shop about 30 years ago in Chicago, but it's since grown to this global organization. They not only build sets, but they, they plan entire events for large-scale operations. Well, uh, last year, things were going a little bit better for us in Chicago. If you're a, if you're a sports fan, uh, the, the Blackhawks were m making their way toward the Stanley Cup final. And on the eve of what could have been the, the, the night that uh, the, the Blackhawks could cinch the title, the president was home watching the team, cheered on with, like everybody else. He got to work the next day, and his phone was ringing off the hook. Turns out it was the mayor's office asking if their scene shop could produce the celebratory rally in Grant Park. And uh, actually, it turned out to be in Soldier Field because uh, the, the Grant Park had, was, was soggy from days of rain. So he was, he was excited that they were given this opportunity. He didn't panic. However, he was told that he would only have 48 hours to produce this event to build the sets, to load it in, to, or, to organize uh, 650 pounds of confetti to be shot out of a confetti cannon, to route the, the 60,000 fans into Soldier Field from this parade route that had two million lining it. Anyway, all of those millions of details, he was able to coordinate, not from a command and control structure, because in that kind of time frame, you don't have time for every single decision to be run up the flagpole all of their teams were able to come together because they were communicating, collaborating, and coordinating in real time. They were empowered to solve problems on their own as they arose. They knew what the end goal was. They had some parameters, but they also had decision rights as needed to be sure that they were able to make their deadline. Because when, when you've got a deadline like that and the kinds of deadlines many of you work within, you don't have the luxury of moving the deadline. You've got to work effectively uh, and, and agilely in, uh, it, within the, the givens that you're, you're provided. Uh, and a lot of people, most people work within a team one way or another. And uh, the three things that you say that are very important for agility at the team level are continuous learning, fluid communications, and what you call context creation. Could you describe that particular context creation? That right. seems to be interesting. So, so context creation, it does in some ways relate to some of the lessons I learned uh, working and teaching people to improvise is really about uh, creating the spaces where people can be effective, the spaces where people can step out of their comfort zone, take risks, communicate more effectively. I, I've come to call that space the play space. And I, I don't mean the 
funny hats and games kinds of play. I'm talking about space where we can play with new ideas, play new roles, where there's some more play in the system. So we're, we're thinking about how do we create a space for flexibility. But I also talk about literally having some cognitive room in our context. And, and this is another metaphor from UPS where they discovered that when they're in their crunch times, there's a temptation to send those delivery trucks out filled to the gills. But it turns out that's not a very effective way because not only is it totally overwhelming for the drivers, it feels like they'll be out there for hours and hours and you know, still the, the truck is overwhelmingly full. But also, when it comes to agility, they're often asked to change routes in the middle of the day and then they can't get to the package that's way at the back of the truck. So as a metaphor, it's similar for us when it comes to agility. If we're completely overloaded, you know this for yourself, if your workload is over the top, the chances that you're going to be responsive to an unexpected emergent situation or let alone a new opportunity, be curious and follow your curiosity, we're not going to be entirely agile. So one of the aspects of space is creating some room in our cognitive load, some room in our workload. And this is some of the rationale behind Google and some other organizations that are adopting 20% time. They're creating space for people to tinker with new ideas, to be able to be responsive to something that they're curious about. Because this is a big part of agility. It's not just about being responsive to an unexpected situation. It's also being able to be responsive to a new trend in the marketplace, an emergent idea. And we're seeing that organizations that are staying competitive are creating space for that. They're not just focusing on operational effectiveness. They're consistently creating space to, to innovate and be sure people are being agile in an entrepreneurial way, not just in an adaptive way. Uh, also, one thing that occurs to me is that if anyone who's been in a job for a, for a reasonable period of time, this boss comes in, a consultant comes in, we're going to do things this way, then the next boss comes in, here's another way to do it. And I'm just wondering, you know, how do you make, as you talk about the urge to formalize, yeah. and so you want to implement this, you want to implement agility, or encourage agil agility, maybe it would be a better way to put it, how do you, you know, what processes work better when they're not formalized, and how, how do you resist the urge to formalize something like this, which can hinder it, its effect? Exactly, and, and I, I wonder if any of you here have had the experience where you, you implement some project, some process, it goes really well, and then people want to lock it down, and write a manual for it, and this is now the way we're doing it. <laughs> and I mean, and in some contexts, that's helpful. In, in more operational strategies, that can be helpful. However, I encourage people to resist that urge to formalize because it also can completely suck the life out of the kind of engagement and entrepreneurism and awareness that we need to be agile. So thinking about particularly processes that require engagement or creativity that um, aren't algorithmic, aren't uh, purely operational. I always encourage re resisting that urge to formalize because it will impede agility and it will certainly impede people's ability to engage and feel like I'm really co-creating, I'm really bringing something fresh to this opportunity. And that is very challenging in government contexts and in highly regulated contexts. So it doesn't mean we don't leave roadmaps behind, but we focus on roadmaps that are more strategically oriented, more vision oriented, as opposed to overly mechanistic, step-by-step -step oriented. Do we have time for one more? I know yeah, you had a... Yeah. Hi, um, I just had a quick question following up, following up your comment about formalizing. Mm -hmm. So one of the, I guess one of the roadblocks or hurdles in my when I think about Agile and going from a traditional or a hybrid, um, at least software development IT shop to something mm -hmm. Agile is bridging or bridging or appeasing or making the management feel comfortable that since we don't, we're not formalizing, we're not signing off on anything, our documentation is is going to come down. You know, it's like how do how do we make them feel comfortable about the agile process? Yeah, this is good, and you're speaking specifically about some of the. Uh, uh, I, I hear some of the concepts of the agile manifesto in in what you're sharing. That that agile project management really is um, 
one that focuses on shared agreements with the, the, the partners, not so much on having to have a, a, a huge amount of documentation, which I know is, uh, is challenging in, in government context. One of the things that I've, I've seen organizations that are doing, and very often they are doing, honestly, a little bit of a hybrid between Waterfall and, um, and Agile, where there, there are certain givens that they establish that they're going to work within, and very often those do have some um, budget constraints and time constraints, but within them they're also educating their, their partners, their clients, in this is how we're going to need you to be effective and we expect you to participate in the process so that everybody is set up for success. And, and quite honestly, because many people aren't used to being a collaborator in a, a client situation, it does require a little bit of, um, of education along the way. But I've seen people that are willing to, to take that on and, and uh, find alliances, especially if we can create a clear cost benefit for doing it. Some of you may have seen the, the research, you know, when the, the original rollout of healthcare.gov, um, remember how well that went? Everybody was, was so, so pleased with that. I, you, you don't have to, uh, you know, raise your hand if, if you had anything to do with it, but it was done using waterfall, traditional project management. It was uh, the entire thing cashed in at about 800 million. When they uh, regrouped and, and uh, did the 2.0 version that was done using Agile methodologies, it was estimated that if they'd used Agile methodologies from the beginning, the entire project would have cost only 60 million. So if we can create these kinds of, and there are more and more studies showing the true ROI of Agile methodologies and Agile organizational structures, if we can make the case both to our clients, strategic partners, even internal stakeholders, that's often the kind of thing that gets people's attention. And it does require, as I say, it starts with a mindset shift, but then it really does translate into a shift in, in the way we work together, the way we do business. Okay, Thank I, th you. I think we have maybe one short question and answer. We've got yeah, to vacate the space Yeah, this will be our last here. question, but she is signing books afterwards. Oh, we can, can yes. yeah. <laughs> I have the opposite issue with, with the Army. How do you get organizations to overcome their skepticism? Because they'll say, yes, we had total quality management. Yes, we had balanced scorecard. Yes, no, we have Six Sigma. Oh, now we're going to high reliability organization. Yeah. What flavor of business change is this? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm uh, so glad you asked that. And many of you are probably a bit uh, road weary if you have been through some of those flavor of the month strategies. And, and here's why I really encourage that you don't become overly prescriptive. There, there is not one way that the Agile organization looks or the Agile team looks in, uh, uh, because all of you represent different sectors, different organizations, and I would not suggest um, many of the things you mentioned are very prescriptive and they're, they're very one size fits all, even though pieces can be adapted. So Agile is a mindset. What I suggest are a number of strategies that you can adopt and, and truly adapt for your organizational structure. But it's really much more about making it a strategic priority and understanding that we'll start seeing some significant returns if we make it a strategic priority, if we create organizational structures that are more responsive, if we as, a, as individual leaders, as team members, make a commitment to collaborate in a much more coordinated way. That's very different than saying, okay, we're adopting X or Y. And, and Agile methodologies, even uh, from the project management system, there are some more regimented and kind of scripted processes that you may choose to look into. In my book, I share some of the higher level transferable practices that can work across industries. And, and I've actually had people who work on Agile software teams come up to me and say, you know, we have to kind of retool on our Agile team because we've become a bit prescriptive. So now it's just yet another process that we're checking the boxes instead of um, really bringing a level of engagement and innovation that the process was designed to accommodate. So if you, if you move down a prescriptive path, anything can start to redu become reduced to another how-to. And the commitment, if we truly are looking to create an Agile organization or team, 
is both um, harder but more interesting, just like fitness. Your, the fitness routine that worked for you five years ago likely isn't going to deliver the same results today or maybe even six months ago. We have to continually be scanning our organizational context, our environmental context, and continually thinking about who are we collaborating with, what adjustments might we, we want to make. And those are some of the broader guidelines that I share and some, some pathways to implementing. But uh, to me, that's where the, the exciting opportunity lies ahead, is to, to discover what it looks like in your organization, what makes most sense, and, um, and to let people know this is not another Six Sigma or flavor of the month. Not, not that those haven't been effective in certain contexts, but just be careful that, um, that you don't say, here, we're rolling out yet another thing, because very likely you'll, you'll get pushback, and, and probably for good reason. Okay, well. Well, thank you, Phil. Thank it's been you. a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're, uh, we have to wrap up. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your great questions.